Okay, I guess we go and can go ahead and start. I hope you had a very good lunch. Now that we have a, everyone is nice and full, I guess it's our job uh, is going to be to keep you entertained and uh, awake for the next 40 minutes. It's going to be tough, but we'll, we'll try. Uh, my name is Tondo. I'm with the IBM Silicon Valley Lab in California. Uh, my colleague here is Aba Wa Yang from the uh, China Research Lab in Beijing, and Mohamed Banika Zemi from the uh, Watson Research Lab in New York. So today we will talk about uh, 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 networking for container. And, uh, there's been a lot of work in this area recently, but for uh, our case here, we're going to pick one particular use case and uh, dive deeply into it and understand you know, what's going on in, uh, under the hood. Right. So, so I'll start by giving some background in uh, container and how uh, it, it uh, the state of container networking in OSAP right now. Uh, we won't, we're going to pick Kubernetes, uh, your cluster, as our use case, and we'll, we'll, we'll understand uh, uh, the, the inner working of uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster in OSAP. And uh, Bawa is going to take you then into the performance evaluation and uh, what we observe from uh, Kubernetes running in OSAP. And then uh, Mohammed will uh, talk about um, the opportunity that we see there in the kind of the, the future direction. Right. And then we can end with Q&A. All right, so for container, uh, container is a very useful abstraction for process. Right. So uh, 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 when it comes to networking, then the initial approach has been to uh, just treat it as a process running on a host so that uh, you know, your container will take the host IP and would, would uh, get assigned a port. So that works okay. But then as uh, container become more popular and more uh, prevalent, you know, then we, can, we find that uh, uh, it's, it's pretty cumbersome to manage port. Uh, it's a lot easier to manage IP instead. And this is something that Overlay Network gives you. It, it uh, allows you to have your own, to manage your own IP and, and uh, uh, it isolates you from the underlying uh, network infrastructure. Now, in the OpenStack context, uh, Magnum is a new project. It is a container as a service, and uh, uh, there's also many talk on Magnum, so I won't go into detail for in for Magnum here. But for our case, we're going to use Magnum to uh, uh, build Kubernetes cluster for us to to do the study. Right. So um, the main thing about Magnum is that besides just deploying the cluster and managing your cluster, it really integrate the uh, uh, container side into the fabric of OpenStack. So for instance, you use the Nova instance for hosting, uh, use Cinder for box storage, and most importantly for us here, it, it integrates the container w into Neutron. So for the goal, the goal for our, our study here is gonna be to uh, pick, like I say, a particular case and just to dive deeply into it. We will use Kubernetes cluster. So uh, we use Magnum to build the cluster for us, and then we do, uh, we will we'll go in and understand what's happening uh, in the Kubernetes layer, and we'll uh, do a, a performance evaluation on that. And for hopefully from that, we can figure out you know, what is it that we should uh, work on to make improvement. So if you take Magnum right today and uh, deploy a Kubernetes cluster, this is what you, you get in OpenStack. Uh, so at the top, you see uh, three Nova instances. So here, our cluster is three. Uh, one of them is a uh, Kubernetes master. Uh, the other two are the Kubernetes node uh, that they're going to uh, host your container. So these three instances would have uh, an ETH0 interface, a neutron interface, that connected to the uh, private subnet in a private network. So these are neutron network. And then the, the, the private subnet is going to be connected to the public <coughs> subnet through a router. And we have a, a couple of floating IP that uh, allowed us to uh, log into the, uh, the, 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 the uh, host in the Kubernetes cluster. We also have a number of load balancers. Uh, one is called for the Kubernetes API server so that uh, uh, you can have multiple uh, cube master. Another is for etcd, and then this is used for, uh, by the Flannel. And uh, if you have service that you deploy in Kubernetes that require load balancer, then each of them will have a, a load balancer uh, created also. So this is basically what we get. Right? Um, now before we go deeper into uh, what Kubernetes does in terms of networking, it's, it's helpful to 
understand some of the basic concepts. So I'll describe them briefly here. So there are basically three uh, abstractions in Kubernetes. Uh, the first one is a pod. A uh, pod is basically a group of containers that run on the host, uh, on the same host. Um, a pod would have an IP, and so that means that a, a group of containers that run on the same host would talk to each other uh, using local host. Um, if you, if the container need to talk to a, a part elsewhere, a different part, then you have to use the IP address. That's the, that's the key here. The second abstraction is a service. So a service is basically a proxy for a part. Uh, that's all it is. And with that, a, a service has an IP address associated with it. And the reason for proxy for, for service is because a part is not stable. It could die and be recreated elsewhere. And so with that, the IP for the part can change. So you, 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 don't, you don't want to use the IP for the part to talk to it. Instead, you use the, uh, the service to, to talk to your part. The third abstraction is a replication controller. And uh, so what it does is that it uh, watch a part and it just maintain a exact number of replica for that part. So for our case here, uh, we are mainly concerned with part and service because they require a networking. So to support this kind of a uh, networking structure, uh, Kubernetes used three components. The first one is the kube proxy. So this is a uh, Kubernetes a component that, that run on every node. Right? Uh, the second part is a flannel. And this is a, uh, now there are many different, op there's several options for provi providing networking in a Kubernetes cluster, but flannel is a, a common choice. And basically what it is is, is an overlay network. And then the third thing that Kubernetes managed is uh, a set of ITP, IP table rule, uh, and then this run in the kernel. So we will take a closer look at these components. Right. So now if we take all those together, the the uh, uh, the the uh, the, the uh, open stack structure and the Kubernetes structure, and then this this is what you get. Right? Uh, here you have two nodes. Right? You have a uh, they are connected together on the private network with each is zero. You have a flannel overlay, right? And then you have the component there to support the Q proxy, the IP table. So and here I show two parts, you know, one on each host, and within the part are uh, a set of containers. Right? And you see here that, that the part have an IP, and the, the part on the right side has a service associated with it. So then a, uh, the container from the part on the left would talk, if it talked, if it need to talk to the container on the part on the right, and it would go through the service. Okay. So that's the, how the Kubernetes cluster operate. All right, so next we'll take a deep look at the, what's happening under the cover when, uh, when the networking happened in Kubernetes. So here, uh, I'll walk you through the first, the, the setting up of the networking in Kubernetes. All right. Um, here, a I'm showing a Nova instance coming up for a host. Uh, here we have a, a it has an IP address of 10.100.30.68. So we come up with just the ETH zero uh, interface to Neutron. Uh, outside there's an XCD server, and this this is running on the Kubernetes master, right? So as the host come up, first thing it does is that uh, it will start the final service, and uh, the final what it would do is that it would go through a little protocol uh, in SCD to basically allocate itself a subnet that it could use for this host here. So here we can see that it had uh, um, obtained for itself this uh, subnet 10.100.5.0-24. Uh, so the next, what Flannel would do is uh, create a Flannel 0 tunnel interface on the, uh, on the host, on the node. And then uh, it would add a rule in the IP table, a masquerade rule, for the post routing chain. So basically what it does is that it was, it's going to route all the traffic to the final in zero in, interface. Right. So that takes care of the final uh, overlay. Uh, next, we have the key proxy, which is just a, a process uh, uh, called from Kubernetes that will start up. And then when Docker startup, it's going to create for itself a Docker bridge, a Docker called Docker zero. Uh, and then the bridge is going to get an IP address from the final overlay network. All right, so that provide the, the basic structure. Now, when you start to create a part in a Kubernetes, then basically you will have a, a set of containers that uh, are for the part. For each of those con containers, you have a type interface that would uh, 
uh, connect to a VETH interface on the Docker bridge. Right, so that take care of your pod and container. Uh, your type interface is going to get IP address from the file overlay. Okay. Then finally, when you create a service to proxy to, to be a sub proxy for your pod, uh, then uh, Kubernetes does a number of things. So, so first, uh, it would allocate a IP address from the final overlay network to that service. So here we see that it's getting the address of 10.254.10.54. Uh, next, what happened is that the Q proxy is going to allocate a port. Uh, here we have a port of 42.140, and it's going to start listening on that port. Then finally, um, it's going to add two rules to the IP table. Uh, one in the output chain and one in the pre-writing chain. And what this rule, this rule is, is going to use the IP address for the service. And basically the net is that uh, uh, it's going to route all the traffic targeting this IP address to the port on the Q proxy. Right, so everything is going to go to Q proxy uh, and the Q proxy then would know that, uh, oh, for this IP address, it, it represents uh, the set of part here and it knows how to uh, forward the, uh, the, the message. So that's the structure, right? So now let's uh, take a look at what happened when the message gets sent, all right? So here I'm showing two uh, Nova instances, one on top, one at the bottom. And on the uh, leftmost side, I see show uh, two set apart, right? Uh, the, the one on the top, it has an IP address of 10.100.5.3. One at the bottom has IP address of 10.100.70.2. So the, all these are, are on the final network. So as you remember, the uh, to talk to a container, we, we can't talk to the IP address directly. So we have to have a service. So here we have a, a, a little service, uh, that purple box here, that has the IP address of 10.254.10.54. So that would serve as proxy for the part at the bottom. All right, so let's suppose the part at the top want to talk it to the top part at the bottom, see what happened. Okay, so the first message that come out of the container on the part at the top would uh, go to the Docker Zero Bridge. Uh, it's going to have the, app, if you look at the, the packet, it's, it's going to have the, the source IP address of that part and the destination IP address of the, the service. Right, so that's what uh, we expect. Right, so, so as we remember from the uh, last slide, we have two, the two IP table rules. So what it's going to do is going to capture that packet and reroute it to the key proxy on that port uh, 42140. So QProxy get it, and QProxy um, knows from uh, from the record within uh, Kubernetes that this particular service is a proxy for for the part at the bottom. Right? So it has that mapping. So then what it's going to do next is that uh, it, it's going to uh, ch change the header and uh, um, route that traffic to the correct IP address for that part. So now you see the the it changed both of them. It changed the, the source uh, IP and it changed the, the, the destination IP to the 10.100.70.2. Right. And then uh, the masquerade rule that we saw in the last slide is going to capture that and then route to the uh, Flano Zero terminal network, uh, terminal interface. Right. So that will take you to the Flano uh, daemon. Right. So in Flano, uh, it's going to take a look at that IP address 10.100.70.2. And it knows that that get mapped to the uh, Nova instance uh, with the IP address of 10.100.30.67. Right? So then, what Flano would do is that it would encapsulate that message um, and would give it the the uh, uh, IP address of the two Nova instance. Right? So now we we see that the IP address just changed to 10.30.30.68. You know, for the Nova instance on the top. And the destination is going to be the uh, Nova instance at the bottom. Right? So after that, then it, we end up in Neutron Land. And Neutron is going to do its thing. We will take a closer look next. Uh, the Neutron will do its, its job, and then we deliver the message to the ETH0 interface on the host at the bottom. Right? And that would get passed to Flano. And Flano would uh, unencapsulate the message, and then you get back the uh, the uh, the message that would you know get routed to the right container. So that that's you know the the long story of how the the message would traverse the whole uh, networking chain. Uh, so here we see that the blue, the green, the purple part, the purple message at the top is the original message. 
and then the blue message are the uh, proxy message that, uh, that, that, that Kubernetes, Kubernetes implement. Then the, the green message are the overlay uh, message. And then the red one, red part is a neutron. So that, that, that's just what happened on the uh, Nova instance. Right? So remember, once you leave the Nova instance, we end up in the uh, neutron side. So uh, this is a, a picture that I copy from the neutron networking guy. So I'll just put it here so that we can get an idea of what happened on the neutron side. So here we are using the ML2 driver for OVS. So you once the message leave the uh, Nova instance, is going to end up in the Linux bridge. And this is where we apply the security rule. And then it would end up in the uh, integration bridge. Right? Okay, so from this point on, it depends on the, your kind of network. Suppose you, we use a, a, a VLAN network for our Kubernetes cluster, then what will happen is that it will take the path at the bottom, would go to the OBS LAN bridge, and then from there it would go out to the physical VLAN. Right? And then, now if we had used a uh, uh, VXLAN or GRE network for our Kubernetes cluster, then it's going to take the path on the top, uh, it's going to end up in the OBS tunnel bridge. And then from there, you know, now we have another encapsulation that will happen the, for VXN or GRE. So when you can see that now, you know, in this case, we actually have a double encapsulation, one that happened at the flannel level and one that happened at the GRE or, or VXN level. So that's the, what's happening under the hood. We can see that uh, there's a lot of complexity here. It works, but uh, uh, there's a cost for all this complexity, and uh, it, it gives you flexibility. So what we did next is to um, measure different paths through this whole scenario here, and uh, to understand the, the cost of the, 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 the performance here. Uh, so let, with that, let me pass on to my colleague, Bahwa. He will take you through the performance Excellent. observation. Okay, so this is Bahwa Yang from Bio Research China. Um, I will introduce some, some of our performance and observation part. And uh, during I attend this uh, Winstack summit, I noticed there are lots of container sessions, right? And mostly the people there are discussing the networking problem. So it is a good timing for the networking guys to listen to the application developers. So here I will show some quantitative measurement with real data. Okay. So this is a quick look of our uh, test environment. It's a simple but uh, typical OpenStack deployment. We have three nodes, uh, one controller node and two compute node, and also we have two network with uh, its uh, 10 gigabit. And uh, all, those, uh, all the nodes are IBM X series servers uh, with two CPU, um, 10 cores uh, each, and uh, 256 gigabit memory. And we also have a written hard uh, disk. Well, inside the each uh, compute node, we have uh, put several uh, VMs. And uh, we have two kinds of VMs. Uh, one is for the um, Kubernetes master, and the others are Kubernetes uh, slim nodes. And inside the Kubernetes slim nodes, there are, we, we were running the container. OK, so just uh, nothing special. So the scenario um, consider here, um, we have three kinds of traffic paths and the three kinds of neutron implementation. The traffic part include the server to server, and the VM to VM, and also pod to pod. Well, um, oh no, sorry, consider to cons uh, container to container. Well, consider the container to container scenarios, we, we, we have uh, also three types. Uh, in containers inside the same pod, and uh, different pod, but on the same host, also different pods on uh, different hosts. So here I want to ask a question. How many people in this room are networking guys? Please raise, raise your hand. OK, there are a few. Um, OK, if you are not networking guys, um, oh, sorry. What happened? Oh, See you later. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Some mistake. OK. There you go. OK. So please remember these two concepts. Uh, throughput and latency. This is really important because if you know these two concepts, you are almost the networking expert. <laughs> okay. So the first chart I show here is the um, uh, VM level performance. 
In VM level, we, we utilize the neutron for the overlay, so there is a single layer of overlay. So if you look at the chart, uh, we ha actually have four cases, the server to server, and uh, VM with the flat networking, uh, VM with VLAN, VM and VXM. So compare with the uh, server to server uh, with VM flat, um, the bandwidth drops to, uh, to nearly 18%. However, the, the, the latency increased to over three times. Well, compared with uh, VM flat to VM VLAN, the, the only difference here is the tag, right? And uh, the bandwidth doesn't change too much, right? And the latency increased uh, 10%. And uh, compared with VM flat to VM overlay, here the difference is we introduce a single overlay layer, right? The bandwidth drops too much, right? Uh, is to nearly 26% and while the latency doesn't increase that much. So I want to um, emphasize here, um, actually from this chart we can see, if we consider the throughput, the overlay is, is important, right? Overlay kills the throughput, while the virtualization layer kills the latency. It, it is, it's a very important. So what is the um, performance bottleneck for the single overlay cases? Actually, um, it is known as the packet processing capacity. Um, here we, uh, we, give the, we show the data, uh, VM to VM using uh, uh, VXLAN data. Um, we change the MTU, the maximum transform unit size, from, uh, nearly, from 1450 to 1000. It means we will generate more packets. It, it, it occupies CPU processing capacity, and the bandwidth will decrease sharply to half. So that's why hardware offloading is where uh, is, is widely adopted uh, in physical hosts. Uh, actually, to optimize this case, there are also other techniques. Uh, for example, the jumbo frame. But you should take care of using such kind of techniques. Um, for example, we, we should uh, consider the fragment problem. Um, it seems with, with only single overlay, the performance dropped a lot. So is it really bad? So this is a picture from our previous results in Wacova. So it shows with, with a single flow, the bandwidth usage is bad, right? However, when we increase the flow numbers, the bandwidth usage will increase to nearly a full utilization. But with too many flows, the number will come drop down. So I guess the uh, answer to my previous question, it, it, it can be true, right? So I think the the answer here we should um, uh, it should be we should consider the workload. So, do our application actually need a single high uh, throughput flow? For some cases like NFA, this this the answer is true, right? But if we consider cloud computing, we consider IoT. It's naturally multi tenants and naturally multi flows, so the the answer cannot be true. So this, the previous results, we only focus on the VM layer. Here we are dropping, we are go to the container level. So when we consider the container level, the scenario will become complicated because the existing container um, techniques uh, such as Kubernetes is already implement some overlay techniques. So if we just directly put the Kubernetes on side of OpenStack, then what happened? There are double VXLAN, there are double overlay, right? So if you're a networking guy, uh, you know for, for, the sim the, for similar scenarios uh, in VLAN, there are some standard uh, queue in queue to try to solve the double tagging problem. But for double overlay, there's no good solution now. So we also compare the throughput um, drop and the latency uh, increasing. The throughput drop here is over 40%, okay? And the latency increasing is over 30%. It looks not that good. However, compared with the, the single overlay 
uh, overhead, which is over 17 percent and which over 200 percent. This number is not looks that bad, right? So, to optimize the performance, actually there are many kinds of viewpoints. What I want to show here, it is simple but uh, very important, is networking backend is, it doesn't matter. So here we compare the uh, Flannel implementation with different networking background, backend using UDP and uh, VXLAN encapsulation. These are, those two are very uh, popular uh, encapsulation uh, techniques. And uh, it looks, the VXLAN encapsulation, it obtains three to five times throughput. Wow, the number looks w wonderful, right? Um, no, we 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 just uh, tested the UDP and the VXLAN. The, these two is are recommended by Flannel. Okay. So we also check the other uh, the additional cost introduced by the Flan, uh, Kubernetes or Flannel um, components, such as IPT boards and uh, cool proxies, and uh, the throughput and uh, the latency looks uh, change a little. So what if there is no overlay and uh, no VLAN tagging and uh, no virtualization, the pure container to container performance? Here is the result. We test uh, um, two paths on the same host. Uh, these two paths are connected uh, by directly by a single link bridge. And uh, the number looks that not that good. It's over 30% uh, throughput drop while the latency increase uh, over half. Okay, I'll finish the part and move to Mohammed. So I'm going to talk about uh, a few things that are happening uh, to improve networking for containers in the context of uh, uh, OpenStack and beyond. And I'm going to talk about a few things that you may have already heard about um, uh, from previous sessions, but I'm going to uh, briefly talk about uh, a couple of uh, new, uh, relatively new efforts that are happening. Um, as you guys may be uh, aware, uh, Magnum is uh, going through a phase of defining the container networking model and trying to provide a more generic uh, networking system where you can have different types of uh, networking for your containers within Magnum. Um, at the same time, there have been significant amount of work on the Docker side. Um, I will briefly talk about Lib Network and what that brings uh, into the picture. And uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the, uh, an open SAC project that got started a few months ago called Career, where um, uh, Dockers are uh, containers are connected to uh, neutron networks. And I uh, finally will talk about um, uh, one effort that is um, happening within the neutron community to help uh, uh, networking uh, for containers. So, um, as you guys may know, uh, Docker ended up uh, becoming a more modular uh, piece of software and one of the main pieces uh, that got uh, its own module and got separated from the core Docker engine uh, was uh, the networking module. Um, Lib Network was created um, and introduced in Docker 1.7. Uh, it stayed as on the experimental branch for a couple of cycles, but by the upcoming release uh, 1.9, it will be part of uh, the Docker uh, release. Um, it implements um, what they call the container network model, not to be confused with the similar term in uh, Magnum. Um, it has a few simple concepts, uh, not very different from what we have in Neutron. Um, there is a notion of sandbox that 
contains the configuration for a container networking stack and networks, collection of endpoints that can communicate with each other. And um, endpoints are essentially what connects uh, containers or sandboxes to these networks. And, uh, these are pretty similar to um, uh, the concepts we have in Neutron. Um, in addition to becoming a separate module in Docker, uh, the main improvement uh, that we are witnessing is the fact that LibNetwork is uh, extendable. It, is a, it has a, a simple but uh, powerful uh, pluggable architecture. It comes with a few drivers, um, namely the null, uh, host, bridge, and overlay drivers. Um, the bridge um, driver is essentially the main uh, traditional Docker networking, it, the code has been redone, but it provides what you used to get uh, uh, by default from um, Docker. And uh, there is a new uh, driver which does multi-host networking in Docker uh, through the use of overlay networks. In addition to these four drivers, there is a remote driver and uh, that acts as a proxy to uh, utilize uh, Docker network plugins. So, uh, in the bigger picture of uh, plugins in Docker, you can have network plugins and they can um, implement networking um, um, API um, through the remote driver. It, uh, the remote driver uses a simple JSON RPC to talk to a Docker network plugin, and that Docker network plugin can realize the networking needs in any way possible. One possible solution would be utilizing uh, OpenStack Neutron. And that's um, where project Courier come into the picture. Uh, Courier is a do essentially a Docker network plugin uh, that uses Neutron to implement networking for Docker containers. Uh, it gets uh, utilized through the remote driver of uh, LibNetwork. And um, the plan is to um, uh, use the Cola uh, project and provide containerized uh, images of common Neutron plugins for ease of use. Um, the project is very new. It started just uh, mid-cycle, Liberty mid-cycle. Um, and we hope to have a first uh, uh, release by the end of Mitaka. Um, there is a lot to be done, but we've just got started. It's part of the OpenStack ecosystem. It uses uh, Keystone for authentication, Neutron for doing networking, and uh, to the extent possible, it uses other uh, possible uh, OpenStack uh, services, whether it's Oslo or um, Neutron client and so on and so forth. It essentially is a simple plugin that maps Docker networks to, what else, Neutron networks, Docker endpoints to Neutron ports. And um, now with the latest release, um, Docker provides also IP address management. There is a pluggable IPAM uh, driver there um, that can be equivalent of subnets, uh, as you know, in uh, Neutron. And um, similar to how um, Nova plugs and unplugs um, um, virtual interfaces into VMs uh, and the network, um, uh, Docker has join and leave. Um, and um, for different types of virtual interfaces, that needs to be done uh, through different pieces of code, similar to what that we do in Nova and to some extent, I, I believe, in Neutron for certain services. Um, so with that, I just want to uh, mention another effort within the Neutron community. Um, VLAN Aware VM, which was started uh, last cycle, the spec got uh, approved and uh, the work uh, uh, has been carried out. Um, it turns out that uh, this is a solution that is very useful for um, 
having nested uh, configurations where you have containers within VMs, something that we have in Magnum, and there is inter interest in having such a nested architecture for various reasons, <coughs> mainly um, security reasons. So in order to avoid uh, having overlays on top of overlays, one possible solution would be uh, the proposal for VLAN aware VMs where there are two types of ports and uh, a new type of port called trunk port gets defined as a new resource in uh, Neutron and uh, other ports can carry some information about uh, VLAN IDs that uh, get utilized to distinguish uh, traffic that are coming originating from different containers uh, from within a VM. Um, there is a parent uh, children relationship between these ports, so each sub port or uh, neutron port can belong to a different network, uh, and the VLAN tags that are used here is just to distinguish um, the traffic within the VM. Um, the initial patches are out for review. It has been um, 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 renewed kind of interest in this subject. The original proposal uh, wasn't mainly targeting containers within VMs, but it turns out that it's the perfect solution for supporting containers within VMs. Um, so there are multiple communities within Neutron and Magnum and um, uh, Open vSwitch or Oven that are interested in this effort. Hopefully, we will see this um, being uh, moved forward uh, with uh, wider participation from the Neutron community. Um, with that, um, uh, I want to uh, conclude our talk but, but by saying that there is a lot ha uh, that is happening in the networking side uh, for containers. We are just getting started, but as things are moving uh, really fast, we are trying to catch up with all the developments uh, that are ha happening in the uh, container communities, uh, in particular Docker, and um, um, we are just at the beginning of uh, this journey that is going to be a fast-paced uh, move, but um, we have a lot of um, uh, areas to cover to support nested architectures, to support different kinds of higher level uh, container services, whether it is Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or Mesos and all that. Um, so this is just a work in progress, but uh, it's an exciting time for working on the networking side of uh, containers. Uh, and uh, uh, please feel free in, uh, to join the efforts either in Neutron, in Courier, or Magnum. Um, with that, um, I think um, we have a few minutes left if there are any questions. Yeah. The last slide, isn't that part of uh, Project Courier itself? No, that's part of Neutron. Um, but does Project Courier handle it? Project Courier hopes to use it. And in doing so, we hope to contribute to pushing it forward. Yeah. The changes are required within Neutron. And hopefully we get Bob's help as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.